Hang on, Lane. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Doug. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. How are you? I am fine, thank you. Um, it's just the two of us now? We're, okay, it is just the two of us. Yeah, um, I think I mentioned the last time we were together about my, uh, about my wife. And, yes, uh, I was going to ask how she is. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. She, uh, she had surgery, it removed the tumor. <laughs> Uh, the testing showed a little more cancerous cells in the area where it was taken. So she's having a second surgery in 13 days just to take more tissue from the site. Uh, other than that, though, you know, they're very, very optimistic that they can, they caught it very early and that she's going to have a complete recovery. She'll probably okay. have to do radiation. Okay. Doubt, I doubt she'll have to do chemo but she'll definitely have to do radiation. Okay. So yeah, that's what, that's well, kind of occupying our lives for a while. Oh my gosh, yeah. I was in England when I saw the text exchange or whatever it was, you know, that had taken place, but definitely have been in my mind and my heart and my prayers. So yeah, well, I will continue to do pray for her. Yeah. Uh, what it's, good to, it's good to hear that they're optimistic. Yeah, they're, they're very optimistic. So this is... This was caught, I think it was stage two. Her sister, Lenann's sister, had stage four and fully recovered. Wow. So, wow. So, uh, and uh, so they're very, like I said, Lenann has not won because she is and has a medical background. She doesn't freak out about things like this. Yeah. She, um, she always has treated it like a problem to be solved, not a crisis. Okay. Which is, and the fact that she, knows so much. Yesterday, we had a 40-minute conversation with some of the medical team, and at times they were speaking languages I didn't quite understand because I'm not in the medical world, but right. she, she came out very um, satisfied with the answer she was getting in terms of what they detected, how much tissue they'll take, you know, what the, and, and it, it's, what they've done is really quite sophisticated I, I, I was unaware of something called a, a tumor board where they get a bunch of people together and they go tumors that they're dealing with. And they and so they have all these minds in the room together wow. asking questions. And um, that's that's pretty clever. That is. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be that when you heard the word cancer, you just felt like, oh boy, that's a death sentence. And yet that's so far from the case anymore, you know? And uh, depending on the kind of, well, you know more than I do at this point, but uh, on so many variables, you know, it can be a pretty optimistic scenario. So that's, that's so cool. Yeah, so we're encouraged. Yeah. Uh, and it, it kind of throws a, a monkey wrench into some of our plans. Um, Lenan is still planning on, uh, I'm just bringing up the document. I'm going to take notes on over here. Um, it's it's funny you said you were in England. We had planned to go to Britain for our 40th wedding anniversary. That was awesome. That's exactly what we did two years ago, and that's from Mr. Scam. Um, and uh, we got COVIDed out, and we were planning as kind of a retirement trip to go in September, and now it's like. You know, um, she's saying my immunities will still be compromised on the dates we had planned. Wow. So we just bumped that off till next summer. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, we, it was our 40th wedding anniversary. We uh, delayed it for two years. It would have been 2020. That didn't happen. And yeah, we, we went and, um, you know, fortunately we had a pretty normal trip. You know, I mean, you didn't have a lot of COVID protocol that you had to follow except to get a test to come back to the States. But then, you know, our system isn't going through cancer treatments and all of that is either. So, yeah. Yeah, where are you planning to go? Uh, where? Um, we're going to do a package with Trafalgar and 
you know, do a package tour of the of okay. Greg. Nice, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So cool. Uh, we that, we've been a couple of places in Europe, but not anywhere in the UK. Okay. Yeah, that was my first time. So it was it was great. Yeah. And you will love it with your interest in history, church history, and theology and stuff like that. I mean, I think I finally got. Uh, a couple of the successions and the dynasties and who killed who, you know, <laughs> it was, it was still yeah. Bloody Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, Elizabeth, who are they? How does that all relate? I, you, you, know. you know, I actually read Winston Churchill's uh, History of the English Speaking People. Wow. And in the, in, the, in the middle part, it's like, man, this person was beheaded, another page, and that person, it's just one violent death after another seemed to punctuate the history. That's right. Which, so yeah. we have some way as a as a world. Yeah, yeah. It's like a second kings, you know, right in <laughs> Yeah, right now I'm like devotional. I'm plowing through I'm in First Chronicles, which can be a little slow. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well you gotta take all of those uh, genealogies seriously, you know. So well, the, here's the way I look at it. One day I'm gonna meet somebody whose name is only mentioned once in Chronicles. There you go. What did you do? And I said, Well, I did this and the other thing. So how about you? I'm in the Bible. <laughs> okay, you win. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, man, I'm looking at the time. I hope some people hop on here pretty soon. I want to see, I want to see Steve get on here. That's the guy I want to see get on here. So. Uh, wh- which? Who? Steve Cuss, the guy, the presenter. Oh, yeah. Well, that's important. Yeah. I just had this sitting here kind of on program to pop. Oh, we're getting a tie is coming in. But uh, so I, I, I knew it, really, but it, it couldn't hurt. Hi, guy. How are you? Good. How are we doing? Doing well. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. Trying to figure out what to click here. Yeah. The camera. There always, always, always the challenge, isn't it? I don't know how many of these Wednesdays I can make, but today I was able to. So there you go. Good. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good. I'm gonna, good I'm gonna be... Go ahead, Glenn. I just said good to hear your voice, Doug. Well, I saw your picture somewhere. Yeah, well, uh, it's one of those times where I don't think I'm the problem here. So. <laughs> no, I was on Facebook or something. I saw your picture, you and your wife. You look very nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did this thing for Easter where we we said, you know, come on Easter and get a family portrait. And we have a guy that's a very good photographer. And uh, it's also a great way to get some email addresses. And he had it all set up really nice. Yeah. And just email a couple of pictures to people and make made them happy. That's so great. That was, our, that was our picture. Well, that's good thinking. So, Ty, I'm delighted. I'm going to be in San Diego tomorrow, and there's going to be a small pastor's gathering. Um, but David Sign said he couldn't attend because his pastor mentor group is meeting. And I thought, way to go, man. He's got, he's got his priorities right there. So I appreciate how... how uh, you he's short to- enough to be in your small pastor meeting. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate how you guys have brought him in. And I know he's, he's a help there, too, so it's cool. He's, he's been a real blessing in the group. Yeah, he's a good guy. And um, there he is. This will be our first time with, uh, you know, we're going to be back at Second Baptist with Ivan. Yeah. And he started back on April 10. So this will be our first meeting back. Okay. In okay. person. Yeah. Uh, I am going to email the presenter. Because I don't see him on yet. And um, he's kind of a guy that I'd like to get on here real soon. Hey, while he's doing that, uh, Ty, your your church did a great job hosting us back in February. Well, thank you. Uh, I really think if I had the, the one meeting of tm that i i found the same single highest impact was this last february so 
That's great. So it was a great setting. It was it was well done. We, and we I, did a we did a graduation this last week for the uh, uh, Christian high school across town, and they all brought you know lays flowers with them. Right. And then dropped them and stepped on them everywhere. I mean, there's just, there's flower petals, scar stains everywhere. It's like the Honolulu Airport, huh? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It looks kind of like the Honolulu Airport. <laughs> it looks like Kirk is dropping in. That's always fun. And it is Mobile Kirk. It is Mobile Kirk. How are you, Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Where are you going? Hey, we're heading uh, through Phoenix to Tucson tonight and then Fort Stockton. We're moving my mother-in-law to Texas. Oh, to the Great Republic. Uh, to the, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and when everything falls apart, you guys can come join us across the uh, county or the government line or whatever it is. <laughs> or country line, yes. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, I get it. I, I love Robin there, just kind of driving away. Hey, Robin. Yeah, there's Robin there. driving away. There's Kirk just chilling out, just chatting. He wasn't just course. driving. She was giving notes under her breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got, uh, she wants to know, we got, we got Doug. We've got uh, Glenn Lane. We got Ty Guy. It's Hello, more fun than a boy. Hi. Says. <laughs> so, so where are you guys right now, Kirk? So we are, um, we're about 70 miles from Blythe, heading out, you know, kind of the California desert. Okay. 70 miles from Blythe. That's a, that's an open church. Uh, <laughs> Is that right? You, yeah. What, what would you do? To, what would you do to attract people to Blythe? <laughs> I'll let you know in 70 miles. Probably don't have much wisdom about that. You got to love the moon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So presenter hey there he is hey steve hello how are you yep. guys good how are you doing good doing well good Let me just tilt this so i don't get as much uh sun shining here yeah i we have uh some others that are supposed to be on this but we wanted to make sure that you were on it so we'll, we'll wait a little <laughs> <Yes>. bit <laughs> to get going yeah. so no yeah problem. yeah uh, thank you for making the time to do this. We're looking forward to what you have to share. Uh, of course, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, where are you now? In you're in the Denver area, the, or um, and, and Steve, where are you pastoring now? Yeah, I'm in uh, Broomfield, Colorado. So it's about halfway between Denver and Boulder. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah I've been and here then, since 2005, and I was in Las Vegas before that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, as I mentioned in a briefly in an email exchange, I think I remember your name, but I know we never met. I'm still in Las Vegas in Henderson. Uh, oh, you are? I okay. Am. Yeah. Uh, so I remember your name, but I don't think we ever had the opportunity to meet while you were here. Oh, so. that's fascinating. What church are you part of there? You know, gosh, in 2005, I would have been at Warm Springs Baptist Church. For sure. Yeah, just yeah. up the road. Yep. Yep. So, and... Um, so Judd just came when you left or Gene, you were there with Gene and Judd. Is that it? How's That's that right. Yeah. I, I don't remember the exact dates, but roughly two years with Gene and then six months with no one. And then about two years with Judd. Okay. Yeah. Both great guys. I mean, they're both, I uh, was really, yeah, I'm impressed with both of those guys. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And where were you from in Australia? Perth on the west coast okay. yeah how many of you on this call have been to australia kirk you have been yeah where did you go kirk um, kirk is needing to drive the most largest city down there um it was uh um what's the big one down not in the north melbourne or that's Robin. On the north coast? Uh -oh. That yeah. would be Darwin. <clears throat> hey, Ron. So, um, be freezing up. Yeah. We have a number of others who should be on this call, as you know, but I, I'm going to honor the time for Steve and honor each of your times and get going with this at this point. 
Um, so um, I um, was first exposed to Steve through his book, uh, Managing Leadership Anxiety. Um, but the concept that he talks about in that book is not one that was new to me. I think I was first introduced to it when, uh, with the idea of being a non-anxious presence. And that was the important thing that a leader needed to bring to a situation. But I think the whole topic that Steve is talking about is something that uh, each of you on this phone call uh, will find valuable for yourselves in terms of any kind of leadership that you do at this point. But I'm especially um, trying to think of the, the way that you can help coach others who are in situations or who are leading you know, different kinds of contexts. And um, I, I wanted this to be a Zoom call because I want it to be interactive. I want us to think like we're sort of sitting around a, you know, a big table, a bunch of round tables or something like that. And um, Steve's gonna start with a presentation, but uh, then we're, we're, you really are gonna decide where you want it to go. So um, based upon what you're hearing and how it can be helpful to you, and the questions that you ask and the follow-up that you bring, that's gonna kind of steer the direction at that point. So Steve, um, I expect some others to come on, but I wanna welcome you. Thanks for being a part of it. Let me pray and thank you, the rest of you for joining and uh, we'll just jump into it. Um, Lord, uh, we thank you for um, what you have entrusted to each of us. Lord, it's a high calling to um, be involved in leadership in your kingdom. And Lord, we want to do it well. And we recognize that it involves not only skills that we bring, but Lord, it involves our very selves and our presence, our being in situations and with people. I thank you for Steve, for the work that he's done, uh, Lord, for the good work that he's done in this area. And I pray, Lord, for these next minutes to just be so helpful that, Lord, uh, you'd give sensitivity and discernment to Steve, that, Lord, um, each person on this call would feel the freedom to kind of go in a, a direction that would be helpful. Lord, we give this time to you and thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sure, Steve, I'm going to share the screen with you and we should be good to go. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, very good to meet everyone here. I think uh, just checking, I don't believe any of us have met before. So it's good to spend time with you. And obviously, I know with something like this, when you don't know the presenter, you're not quite sure what to expect. But essentially, what we're going to do today is just give you, a, we're going to begin with a, the simplest framework, just a very simple framework to help you notice anxiety. Uh, and, and what you're doing is two things. You're, you're locating, okay, where's it coming from? That's the first thing. Where's the anxiety coming from? So for example, you might already be thinking of an elders meeting and um, maybe you don't so much dread the elders as an elder. That's often what would happen is when you think of the elders collectively, you think, oh, what a great group of people. But there's always that one elder, there's Peter. And uh, he's generating uh, a larger than an average percent of anxiety. If you have six elders and you, you, you know whatever the math is there, let's make it easier. Five elders, that's 20% of anxiety per elder. But man, Peter is generating two thirds of it in your brain. So what we're gonna do is, is give you a simple framework to first of all, locate the anxiety that's being generated. And then the second thing we're going to do is help you notice who's catching it, who's catching it. And uh, that's what Doug's kind of referencing with this idea of a non-anxious presence or a calm presence, because the general rule in leadership is the most anxious person in the room holds the most power, unless there's a calm leader in the room to offset it. You can read your gospels just through that lens. All you have to do is open your Bible take a look at Jesus and the Pharisees or even the disciples or sometimes like a disciple's mother always cracks me up. You know, when James's John, John's mom says, Hey, I've just got a very small request, very minor request. And she wants basically half the kingdom for her boys. That's an anxious mom. You know, that's a classic Jewish anxious mother. And then you see Jesus calmly noticing where anxiety is coming from and noticing who's catching it. And of course, what's most common is that we catch it and we don't even know we have it. So I'll just take you back to my very first job out of, out of a Bible college. I was a trauma chaplain. If you've read my book, you're familiar with some of my stories of being a trauma chaplain. For those of you who are familiar with clinical pastoral education, that's what I did. 
uh, just in the way that a medical student does a medical residency, um, a ministry student can do a chaplain residency. And this happens all over the world. Whatever city you're in, they probably have chaplain residencies. That's what I did. So I was 24. I'd been married for one week. And uh, the, the day my honeymoon ended, uh, my wife, Lisa, dropped me off at the hospital. I had an overnight bag because I was doing a 28-hour overnight shift, just like you see on the TV hospital dramas. Chaplains do that too. We have a little bed that we get to sleep in. We're on call overnight. It's pretty intense. And um, the chaplain supervisor was orienting the new residents around the hospital. 660 beds, level one trauma, which means we have the helicopter. Um, hospice, which means that we not only have people come and die in the hospital, but sometimes we go to their home and we help them die in their home. And uh, I'd never seen a dead body before doing this work and I'd never had any personal experience with grief. I was a total rookie. And within, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half, one of my beepers went off and uh, I looked at the supervisor and I had several beepers because I was the overnight guy. I was the first one doing an overnight shift. And I said to Randy, um, wh which one's the blue beeper? Because I couldn't get them all straight. I had four beepers on my belt. And Randy said, oh, that's the code team. You got to go. And uh, I looked at Randy and I said, okay, um, what do I do exactly? And he looked at me and he said, well, um, we're all about to find out, aren't we? And I thought he was punking me because I was the youngest by several years. I was the kid, but he wasn't punking me. He was quite serious. And I said, okay, um, what if I make a mistake? And he said, uh, he said, this year, you're going to make hundreds and hundreds of mistakes. And with that little pep talk, uh, that's all I had. I, about two minutes later, maybe three minutes later, I'm in an intensive care waiting lounge. And I'm with 12 screaming people. Their mum had died on the surgery table unexpectedly. The doctor had just given them the news. I walked in, there's doctors and nurses trying to manage the chaos. They see me, they see the chaplain walk in and they all leave. So it's me and these 12 screaming people and I have no idea what to do. And this is the first moment where you can start to locate anxiety Anytime you as a leader are in a situation where you don't know what to do, but you're required to do something because you're the leader, you're going to get anxious. It's just a universal source of anxiety. Put a leader in a situation where they're not sure what to do, yet they are responsible. They, do, they may not know what to do, but they are the responsible party. They have to make the call. Um, of course, most of us probably, I'm guessing, on this screen did some kind of leadership through COVID. Uh, COVID and Kerry Newhoff are the reasons why I'm now doing this work full time because COVID didn't make us anxious as leaders. It just exposed the anxiety we didn't know we had because it was a two year exercise in not knowing what to do and finding us at the end of our rope. So we're gonna start, let's see, there's 12 of us on this call. Uh, and so we're just gonna start by inviting you to unmute, just need one or two volunteers. And I know how this works. You can. You can try to outweigh me, but I am a former chaplain and you can't out silence me. I'm just going to get that out of the way right now. I'm happy to sit on this call for an hour and a half and stare you down. So I would prefer rather than that, that you just be brave and be willing to share. If anyone might be willing to share a situation in the last year or two where they didn't know what to do, but they had to do something. And what we're interested in, just give us a little bit of that. Okay, what was the situation? But then what was going on inside of you? What, were you? what was going on in your brain? Or what was the story you were telling yourself? That's what we're really interested in. What's it like for you when you don't know what to do? I'm just going to ask for one or two volunteers who might be willing to share. Um, I'll share. Um, so I won't make you wait. So David Cook, I'm up in uh, Northern California, uh, pastor here. Um, so uh, uh, it's sort of amazing to think it was just a year ago. Um, a year ago, I had to kick out our foster child um, who we'd been uh, guardians of, who was uh, 16. Um, and because he, uh, COVID, you talk about COVID, uh, totally kicked his butt um, and ours. Uh, my wife's a teacher, I'm a pastor. 
he was a junior um, and he got heavily into marijuana and alcohol, um, self-medicating, um, and then he was isolated and he's highly social and he would not obey anybody's rules. Um, and I had to be do the man thing of the house and say, if you can't live by any rules, you can't live here. Um, and it was excruciatingly painful um, because you're supposed to be Jesus. You want this person to know Jesus. He's resisting everything that you are and who you are. Um, and he has no, he literally had nobody else. Um, and, um, and trusting and, and, and having to relinquish legal guardianship. So, and go through the court proceedings to do that, to say, we cannot do this anymore. Um, and, uh, it was, it was hugely conflictual leading up to it and then going through it and then having a wife who is, has very high empathy, um, high compassion and is a mar literally a marathon and ultra marathon runner who never gives up. <laughs> so, um, it was, uh, it was very painful. Um, and, you know, and, and then, you know, I'm a pastor in COVID and in all that crap as well. It's going on in the background um, and the foreground. So how did, how did I feel? Um, um, felt very uh, defeated um, and very um, uh, conflicted. Um, uh, not, you know, knowing it was the right thing to do, also questioning it was the right thing to do. Um, it was self uh, caring for self and our family. We had lost our home um, in our desire to be merciful and graceful. We had um, sacrificed our boundaries and our values. So to have to take those back. Um, so it was very, very messy. And um, it was uh, so physically, it was exhausting. Um, and, um, and yeah, so those are some of the thinking, feeling, um, doing pieces um, within that. Yeah. Yeah. So David, I mean, you just you you just knocked it out of the park with an example. You you picked one of the most excruciating situations that a person can find themselves in. Yeah. Uh, partly partly exacerbated by the fact that your passion is to love and serve someone in a vulnerable population. Right. And yet you're forced into what we would call in the system theory, what we call a double bind, which is whichever path you choose, you lose. <laughs> there's no there's no win in this. Yeah. And you, you are forced to choose. So thank you, first of all, for being willing to share that. And and it really, I also appreciate how you took us from, okay, here's what happened, but here's what it, it feels like. Because all leadership, whether it's parenting or pastoring, is highly personal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what generates our anxiety is the meaning we make about ourselves, mm -hmm. the decisions we make. So mm -hmm. um, when I'm in this intensive care and these 12 people are screaming, and I have no idea what to do, I very quickly go to feeling stupid. It doesn't take long for me to get to where I feel stupid. If you put me in a situation today where I really don't know what to do and everyone's looking at me, I generally have to manage this kind of childhood feeling of stupidity. Otherwise, I will react instead of respond. So, And the David, internal dialogue that goes with that, right? Yeah. So That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. And then you bring that internal dialogue into your future meetings, whether it's staff meetings, elder meetings, and it becomes a cumulative effect. And, and by and large, not to get too far down our road, but this is a lot of the reason why a lot of pastors are resigning. Um, they think it's because of workload, but it's because of unaddressed chronic anxiety. Hmm. The number one uh, reason for burnout in ministry is unaddressed chronic anxiety. I'll define our, our terms here in a minute. So there I am in the room of 12 screaming people. I don't know what to do. I'm feeling stupid. Uh, behind me, there's about 50 people waiting for their loved ones. If you've been to a hospital, you know, intensive care, everyone's kind of in the family room together. And particularly back in the 90s, people would just bring pillows and sleeping bags and just live in recliners while their loved ones were in the intensive care. So the, the anxiety from the 12 screaming people had infected me because I didn't know what to do, but also had infected the people behind me who were worried about their loved ones. And one of the things that makes me anxious is I feel responsible for everybody. It's not healthy, but I do. 
And so I was feeling like it was my job to make sure the 50 people behind me were okay. Right about this time, a charge nurse barrels in. I don't even know the job about an hour and a half. Uh, the day before I'd been on my honeymoon, like it was quite the contrasting experiences from the day before to this day. And the, the charge nurse barrels in and she uh, beckons me out of the room. And uh, I can tell by her posture that I'm in trouble with her. And uh, she tells me off like a mum. She actually hits her hands. Come on, chaplain, she says. Let's get the family in to visit their dead mum. Let's get them out. I need the bed. I've got to change the sheets. I've got patients waiting. Let's go. And she turns on her heels and walks away. One of the guaranteed ways to make me anxious is if I've disappointed you. Um, or underneath that is if you don't like me. I'm a chronic people pleaser. So, of course... I walk back into the room with the 12 people and now I'm clinically what's called flooded. I am no longer aware and present and connected, which is what our job is as pastors. I'm now full of reactivity. I've got my own stupidity feeling. I've disappointed a nurse. I don't know what to do. I'm feeling responsible for the people behind me. And so I hustled a grieving family in to visit their dead mum about two hours before they were ready. They were totally in shock. Uh, they weren't ready. Now, if we just fast forward six weeks, which is how long it takes to be an experienced chaplain, if that had happened again, let me just replay that same story really briefly and show you the difference between being managed by your anxiety to managing your anxiety. The goal is not eliminating anxiety. That'll never happen. If, if Dave and his wife ever decide to take in another foster child, and maybe they will, it'll be a highly anxious situation for them. So it's not ever about graduating from anxiety like we're Yoda or we're like the Dali freaking Lama. That's not the way it goes. By the way, the Dali Lama has no kids, has a fairly straightforward life. So I don't think we should be comparing himself to and Yoda. Anyway, I'm off track. Uh, but the, the goal is to notice your anxiety, notice where it's coming from, notice who's catching it, which means noticing when you've caught it, so that you can name what's generating it, diffuse it, and then walk with God into any situation. It's a powerful tool. So six weeks later, if the same thing had happened, I would have walked into the room, the 12 screaming people, I wouldn't have known what to do but I would have known about myself that that's one of my anxiety triggers. And I would have noticed it, named to it, and give it to God. I then would have felt the anxiety of the 50 people behind me. And rather than catching their anxiety, I would have turned around and addressed them and put the anxiety back where it belongs. A lot of what we do as pastors is we carry other people's anxiety for them, believing it's, lo it's love and it's not. So I would have put the anxiety back on those 50 people. What that looks like is by just letting them know, just saying, hey, everybody, I'm sure it's very uncomfortable for you that these people have just lost their loved one. I just want to let you know, I'm not going to stop them screaming. It's going to take probably two or three hours. So if you need to go get a meal, grab a shower, to now be a great time because it'd be very uncomfortable for you to stay here. Now they are responsible to do what they want to do. I'm no longer responsible for them. When the nurse had come barreling through, I would have known that she had caught the anxiety from her boss. She's under pressure with a patient census. She's trying to get through her day. And rather than her anxiety coming at me and me catching it because she's disappointed in me, I would have known that's one of my triggers. I would have seen through her anxiety and I would have helped calm her down by saying, hey, I'm not going to be getting this family in for two or three hours. So what do we need to do here? I'm even to talk to your boss. What, what can we do? But I just want you to know, I'm not going to rush them in. They're not ready. And also, ma'am, you do not want this family in your intensive care. It's going to be a train wreck. And she might have said, either told me where to take my ideas and shove them. She might have cursed me out, which happened. Or she might have said, oh, thank you, chaplain. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I, I'm carrying so much stress right now. And I could have taken care of her instead of, catching her reactivity so let me just show you kind of what this looks like and everything i i share with you here i'll be emailing to doug and he can pass it on to you assuming he's a kind human being anxiety 
exists and spreads in four spaces. The space inside me, the space between me and the other, the space inside the other, and the space between others. So what I'm going to do is just put this in the chat so we can see it here. This is the four spaces where anxiety exists and spreads. I've got it in the chat. I know a couple of you in the car. And if you can simply learn to notice where the anxiety is coming from, it can make you an exponentially more powerful leader. Particularly when the primary anxiety is coming from inside you. Because the most anxious person carries the most power unless you can be a calm, aware, connected leader then you're the most powerful person in the room. And when I say the most powerful, I don't mean that you can win the argument. I mean that you can be a helpful leader. So the space in me, uh, that's what Dave and I both shared. Here's, what's, here's the story I'm telling myself about myself. That's what's going on inside me. The space between me and the other, that's between me and the nurse. Or, you know, if you're married or if you raise kids, you don't need that, that space explained. The space inside the other, that's any time you are thinking about what someone else is thinking. Uh, obviously, I don't know Dave at all, but I would imagine, Dave, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, feel free to just jump in and interrupt me. But I would imagine, Dave, that you spent quite a bit of your time thinking about the way that young man is thinking. You are trying to make sense of his thinking. Um, oftentimes, uh, those of us who are people pleasers, we obsess on what do these people think of me? Uh, I do this after I preach, for example. I have to do some work. People say, you know, when are you done with your sermon? And what they really mean is when's your preparation done? I always answer them about Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Because once I've preached it, then I now I have to regret it. <laughs> now I have to say, oh, here's what, here's what I should have said or here's how I should have done it. But sometimes if I'm not careful, I will worry about what other people think of the sermon. I'll get all needy like a golden retriever. Um, or sometimes you're frustrated at somebody and you're not thinking, what are they thinking? You're thinking, what were they thinking? It's the same phrase. It's just more frustration. That, that elder, that critic in your church, maybe if you've ever raised a teenager, for example, um, like maybe you've raised a teenager and, and they want a protein bar. So they go to your pantry and they take a protein bar out of the pantry and they peel the wrapper and they put 90, they successfully put 93% of the wrapper in the trash and the other 7% of the wrapper is on the couch all over the house. So by the end of the week, there's little 7% of wrapper spread to and fro throughout the house. And you as their dad are like, what are they thinking? Uh, maybe that's happened to me. Maybe not. I'm not willing to confess. <laughs> In the fourth space, this is oftentimes a space that a type A charismatic driven visionary leader is least aware of. That's the space between others. And I'll especially say, particularly people like me, if you're a white man, you can often be the least aware of what's going on between others before you stepped in. I don't know if you've ever been with preachers. I'm a preacher. But have you ever been with a preacher who's been a preacher so long, they only know how to dominate every space they walk into? I, I went out to lunch with a preacher up the road. He'd been a 40-year preaching veteran, and I was younger, and I went out just to learn some things from him. We walked into a restaurant, and rather than just say, table for two, please, he kind of own the restaurant space. Hey, and he's, hey, and then he's walking around. Hey there, shaking hands. He's like a freaking politician. Do you, maybe you're this way, but do you know somebody like that? Hey, Steve, this, be nice. Come on. Why are you meddling with us? That, that's not very nice. I don't know. You're describing me. That, that, is, I, I, you weren't supposed to tell that story about our lunch together, by the way. Hmm. This is somebody who, um, if, if you can learn to notice the space before you entered it, and the best way to learn this is to notice when somebody else infects the space you're in. That's the best way to start noticing it. So it's these four, the space in me, space between me and the other, space inside the other, space between others. Let me just give us like a, a 15 minute presentation. We'll move as quick as we can. And then we're gonna pause and see 
where you guys want to take this idea because there's a lot of ways we can go with it. So let's see here. I was having trouble. Getting, there we go. All right. So out of all the four spaces, the one space you can't change is, is the space inside the other. Only God can change another human being. Uh, some of you might have a relationship, for example, with an addict, and you're trying to worry your way to their sobriety. Can't be done. And so th that third space, you just have to learn to notice when your brain has crossed into someone else's brain. And you have to learn how to pause, which is one of the most powerful anxiety tools is just to pause and then give that person to God in prayer. Because worrying about what they're thinking is a waste of your time. And if you can learn this discipline, it's quite hard to do. Some of you will have enough time to start a new hobby. Like you can pick up fly fishing with all the extra time you're going to have from no longer crossing into someone else's brain. But the general rule of anxiety management is you spend 80 to 90% of your energy on first space. If you as leaders can pay most of the attention to what's going on in you, you can naturally help other people. This is counterintuitive. Most leaders are others focused or we're mission driven. And so we believe it's selfish to focus on ourselves. I'm telling you it's not. I was not able to help people as a chaplain. You think about what chaplaincy is. Chaplaincy is a stranger representing God to a group of people and, and getting into the most intimate moment of their life. If you've ever been at someone's bed when they're dying, you know that is like a holy intimate experience. And my job as a chaplain was to emotionally connect to people at the worst moments of their life or the most tender moment of their life so I could help them notice God and God could help them get through. The best way to do that was to be aware of myself. Because if I wasn't aware of myself, I would infect what was going on in that fourth space or in that room. So this is the, the hardest sell I make when I do this kind of work is convincing driven leaders, motivated entrepreneurial leaders, um, others focused leaders, convincing them that paying attention to yourself is actually the most selfless thing you can do. All right, let's just talk about the, cl uh, the clinical terms of anxiety because anxiety is a big word. It covers a lot of space. I'm going to go really quick. There's obviously you're familiar with trauma. And then also on this screen, there's like generalized anxiety disorder, or that would be a broad term for any anxiety that requires psychiatric medicine. Uh, I am not qualified to help with these. I'm a pastor. I'm not a therapist, not a clinician. And so the tools I'm going to teach you uh, do not necessarily help with people in trauma or people in psychiatric medicine. All, all I'll say as a pastor is if you or someone you love needs psychiatric medicine, you should take it and you should thank God for it. It's not a comment on your faith or your faithfulness. It's simply a comment on your chemicals. Um, but it would break my heart if you're using some of my tools today to try to address psychiatric-based anxiety trauma-based anxiety. Uh, acute anxiety is anytime like you're driving on the interstate and the person in front of you breaks so hard that you think you're going to hit them. You have to swerve. Acute anxiety is life and death anxiety. Um, it's short term. It usually is over very quickly. It's an actual threat to your body, but afterwards you're able to calm yourself down. So afterwards you can be like, oh man, that was close. So, you know, I've been in these situations with people in my car. We almost get into an accident. Maybe I'm able to swerve. We pull over and then we all just start talking. Our heart's racing. That's acute anxiety. What I teach and what I'm trained in is what's known as chronic anxiety. And chronic anxiety is not short term. It's long term. It's not an actual life and death threat. It's a perceived threat. So when I'm in a room with intensive care people and the nurse is angry at me, my body is telling me that I'm in danger. My body is saying, you are in acute anxiety. My body is lying to me. And every human being has between 12 and 50 generators of chronic anxiety at any given moment. You and I are always carrying a level of chronic anxiety 
where our body believes we are under threat when we're actually not. Does that make sense? Like if I disappoint a nurse, I can thrive as a human, but my body is telling me that I'm in danger. And this is right here, this page here is the simplest explanation I know for pastoral burnout. We're not, we don't burn out because of workload. We burn out because we can't take one more criticism because we've met with the critics, we've reasoned with them, we've tried to give them our heart and they twist it and they demonize us and they talk about us behind their back. And we're like, you know what? I'm just going to go sell Ferraris. That's going to be much more fun and much more lucrative. It's not a workload issue. It's because that, that ongoing perceived threat of not being able to please people, for example. So chronic anxiety is generated by assumptions and expectations, false beliefs, and false needs. So clinically, this is why it's different than trauma. Trauma, for example, is generated by an actual physical event that happened to you in the past. If you ever have any veterans in your church, PTSD. Chronic anxiety, it operates by a different set of rules. It's generated by assumptions. For example, the assumption that everybody who meets me needs to like me for me to be okay. The assumption that every sermon I ever preach must be the best sermon you've ever heard. Uh, the false need for me to always know an answer every time an elder asks me a question. You can start to see just on this page why every human being has dozens and dozens of generators of chronic anxiety in their life. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Out of all the kinds of anxiety, chronic anxiety is the only one that's contagious. Trauma is not contagious. Grief is not contagious. If you're in the room with a grieving person and you come away anxious, you didn't catch their grief. You had assumptions and false beliefs about yourself. Maybe you believe that you were supposed to be able to say something to make it better or do something to shrink their grief. That's because you brought in chronic anxiety and your chronic anxiety infected their grief. And you were not able to stay present to someone in their pain because you hold a belief that your job as a pastor is to always make things better or always have an explanation for why things happen or any number of things. So it's fascinating. Chronic anxiety is fascinating. This is my field. It's, it's contagious. Here's another way you can see it's contagious. Just picture that I'm a pastor and picture that somebody moves from out of state and they come to my church. And after my sermon, they come down front to meet me. Now think about this. They have assumptions and expectations about me as a pastor before they know me as a human. They haven't had time to get to know me. It's their first Sunday. They've only experienced church, but they're carrying in with them from their previous church experience, assumptions, expectations, false beliefs, and false needs. And of course, they're also carrying in true beliefs and true needs. I'm not saying all this is negative, but you've run into these people. Some of them are highly suspicious of you. Uh, simply because, for example, I don't know if anyone on this call is Southern Baptist, for example, but if you're a Southern Baptist and you're a person of great integrity and humility and you love the gospel and you, that doesn't matter because they're carrying all the baggage with them. Or uh, I had, I did a workshop a few weeks ago and I had a young church planner come up to me and he, he said, oh yeah, last weekend, this family moves from out of state. They've been going to this other church for 16 years in this other state. First Sunday, he said, they come up after the sermon and they tell me, they said, hey, our last pastor was the best preacher we've ever heard in our life. Now, they are putting their assumption on him and he caught the anxiety because chronic anxiety is contagious. So let me just stop there and see any response you have so far. We've got a bit more like theory to present to give you some framework, but I just want to be mindful we've been going about half an hour. Is there something that you want to say, something you want to process, a question you have? Uh, this would also be a good time to register a complaint. You can just tell it to me directly or submit it privately to Doug. Um, where, where are we at? And then we'll kind of move on from here. Eve, I would assume that there's, you're going to work on some self inventory as far as how we discover these things in ourselves and how we actually can come to a place of 
identifying some of those things. Um, I reading your book, I thought one of the things that was really helpful was just starting to find ways to name things. Um, and and the list, it was just it was really fascinating taking our staff through that um, together and then being able to discuss that together. But um, realizing like that's not a one time thing. Like it's a you've got to almost learn a skill of how to do a self assessment as you're as you're going to be able to kind of pay attention of what you're feeling, you know, it's in my head, it's in my stomach, it's in my, you know, a tightness in my chest kind of thing. And then say, why am I feeling this? And where is this coming from? That's right, Bill. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it. So yes, today we'll be showing you the five broad beliefs that all humans carry and we'll help you guys figure out which of the five each of you cover. And then in a 90 minute like this, what we're going through is a fairly rapid version of notice, name, and diffuse, which is the three-step process. But I'll also be providing, I'll, I'll give you a link to a, a free PDF I have, which is like the five steps to lower anxiety. And then I can also show you guys um, some resources that are paid, but we, if you want to take a deeper dive in. But today would be like just a, a very kind of quick way of, okay, how do you notice it? How do you name it? How do you diffuse it? But um, we're a couple of steps from giving you the five core beliefs that most humans have. Yeah. Feel core. Anyone else with a comment, critique, feedback, question, and then we'll keep plowing in. All right, I'll keep moving and then just interrupt me if you want to jump in. So what we've done so far is we're now going to have you any any situation, Sunday morning before church, elder meeting. Uh, I know many of you, I believe, are coaches. Is that right, Doug? You've got quite yes. a few people here yes. who coach. Yeah. So th that's a gr coaching is a great place to practice this is as your uh, pastor is coming to you with a situation they don't know what to do with, you and the pastor are trying to figure out where's the anxiety coming from, which of the four spaces, and then who's catching it. So that's where we've gotten so far. Uh, and then we've just kind of clarified, okay, this isn't trauma, it's not grief. This is what's clinically called chronic anxiety. And chronic anxiety is always generated and built on false belief. Now, when you are in chronic anxiety's grip, you are no longer capable of seeing reality. It actually distorts reality. Many of you have run into this in pastoring. How many people in your church have a wildly distorted version of reality? Maybe you've made an announcement about the budget or a staff member or something, and they've connected dots pathologically about it. That's because they're making assumptions and they have false beliefs about you or the church or themselves. And when two people with assumptions and false beliefs get together, the anxiety breeds, you catch it from each other, you infect each other. And the reason I've given my life as a preacher to studying chronic anxiety is because um, if chronic anxiety puts us in a false reality, then what we really truly need in every is the truth. We need truth. We need reality. And so what I've found is the gospel truly is the most powerful tool to mitigate chronic anxiety. Mm. Uh, I did not grow up a Christian. I was not raised. I was actually raised in a secular, highly agnostic and very indifferent family. My family believes that Christians are stupid and weak. That would be just a broad understanding of the Cuss family. And so I'll just let you know, I have bet my whole life that Jesus sets me free. And the way Jesus sets me free is he puts me into the truth. And when I am, when my identity is rooted and established in Christ, and when I'm worshiping my king, I'm free. I'm not anxious. And so that's why I, I picked this field. And also because this is the most common garden variety anxiety for any leader and any parent. So what often happens is when we think of anxiety, we can tend to think of worry and fear. And we say to ourselves, well, I'm not really worried about much and I'm not afraid of really much. So I'm obviously not an anxious person. But chronic anxiety is better understood as reactivity. And so one of the questions you can ask yourself is, 
how do I know when I'm being reactive? How do I know what's the difference between me following God's leading and me being reactive because I'm anxious? Now, that's, that's a question that can take quite a bit of time to get clarity on. But one of the triggers in my life is I have this weird belief, I think because I felt stupid most of my childhood. I have this weird belief that if you ask a question, I have to know the answer. It's completely obnoxious and it's not helpful to build a team, but it's the way I've operated. So there was years, I couldn't have said it this way, but as I looked upon my life, there was years where I had to be the smartest guy in the room. I had to let you know I'm a smart guy. And so during COVID, one of the ways I practice anxiety management is to intentionally not know the answer, even though I did. As our team is trying to figure out all kinds of things, I would intentionally practice saying, I don't know, even when I knew. Now you might be saying, that, that sounds like a lie. I'll just let you know as a pastor, God allows six lies a year when you're doing anxiety management. He actually gives you a little dispensation, six lies a year before uh, he counts that sin against you. But what I was trying to notice is when I'm stepping in to answer, is that because I'm filled with reactivity or is that because God's calling me to be helpful? And it's not easy to tell. And so one of the things you guys can do for your homework is one of the easiest ways to find your anxiety is it's always going to live on the shadow side of your gift. Whatever God has naturally gifted and wired you to be, your anxiety is on the shadow side of it. So I'm naturally good and intuitive as a shepherd. I'm a shepherding old school Eugene Peterson type pastor. The shadow side is I'm a people pleaser. Um, I'm naturally very curious. I love to research. My favorite way of preaching is to broadly research and then boil down for people, kind of like what I've done for you here in this presentation. The shadow side is I must show you I'm intelligent. So that's, that's just another quick way you can start to uncover your anxiety. But one of the things that you can be doing is next time you're in a group of people, try to notice who's getting bigger and who's getting smaller than normal human size. And so people who are bigger, they tend to dominate. They tend to step in. Husbands who get bigger, their wife is pouring out the day and the husband's saying, well, here's how you can handle that. And here, all this advice. The husband thinks they're being helpful, but what they're really doing is they, they're trying to shrink their wife's problem down. They're trying to get bigger than the problem. Uh, I've seen this happen so many times in grief. People don't know what to say to a grieving person, so they say something stupid. What they're doing is they can't handle the size of the grief, so they're trying to shrink someone's grief down to a size they can give a little piece of advice or quote Philippians or something like that. Now, other people, they get smaller. Uh, they suddenly don't feel safe in a room, particularly if someone's gotten bigger. If maybe the dominant leader has gotten a little louder, then they'll kind of shrink down and they'll say, you know what? I'm not going to share everything I think. I'm going to withhold the last 20%. And what I'm going to do, they'll say, is I'm going to have my own secret meeting after the meeting. I'm not going to speak my mind in the room. I'm going to gossip later. And so you can just picture like a boardroom where people are starting to chat and maybe things are getting a little tense and suddenly some people turn into predators and some people turn into prey. You can see there's the turtle under the desk, just kind of got his head in his shell. You can see the butterfly. Like sometimes what will happen is someone will make a joke to break the tension and that's not to help the group. It's because they can't manage their anxiety. So once you've located the anxiety in the four spaces, one of the things that you can do is just start to notice in any group of people who's getting bigger, who's getting smaller. And also, of course, which way am I going right now? Am I getting bigger right now? Am I getting smaller right now? Now, if you can figure out the situations where you know you typically get bigger or smaller, that's really powerful insight as you're walking into a room. So, for example, if I happen to know that I always need to have the answer, I need to be the smartest guy in the room, I need people to like me, I tend to get bigger when I don't know what to do, 
I tend to get smaller in the face of a highly dominant man, then this is all power tools I can use walking into an elder meeting where I can do some work with God before I get into the room so I can stay human-sized in the room. So this notice and naming what normally happens, particularly after like a 90 minute thing like this, is you normally notice it and name it after the fact. You normally have an encounter and then you debrief it later. But over time, having debriefed it, you can start to use it preemptively. You can start to preempt the places that make you anxious and diffuse your anxiety before you walk into them. And it's truly a revolutionary way to lead a team and, and uh, lead your own life. So the goal is to manage your reactivity from spilling onto others. And the goal is to keep from catching the reactivity coming at you. So that young church planter where the family from out of town said that the last preacher was their favorite ever preacher. He's got two options. He can catch their anxiety. What's their anxiety in this case? They're grieving their last preacher. They're missing their home church. They're, they're new in a new town. They don't know anybody. They're putting their anxiety on the preacher. He can catch it and go home and try harder to do better sermons and figure out what kind of sermons that guy did. I've seen young preachers do this. Or he can put the anxiety back where it belongs on the people generating it not in a way that pays them back, not to, there's nothing wrong with what they said. I mean, I think it was probably a bit thoughtless, but it's not a crime. But what he can say to them is, oh, I'm so glad that you loved your previous preacher. Obviously I'm not him, I'll never be him. And uh, we've got a lot of great things here. I, I, we'd love to have you. And if maybe there's another church that fits you, we'd love to help you find it. We're just really glad you're here. I'd be happy to share what we're about. But defining himself, is a way that they have to now carry their grief rather than him catching the anxiety. Do you see the difference there? Mm -hmm. it, it's quite a lot of difference. So in the, in the noticing part, as we now get into some concrete diagnosis tools, the best place to notice anxiety is in your body. So the question is, do you mostly notice it in a spinning mind, a racing heart, a tightening body, all three, or the fifth option is, I'm not sure. Spinning mind, racing heart, tightening body, all three, or I'm not sure. Uh, we're going to have you use the chat to answer. Spinning mind is you believe that you can worry your way to peace. You just think, 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 trying to get to peace. Or you're going into a meeting and you've already figured out the six possible solutions. Racing hard is like you've drunk 10 cups of Red Bull and you cannot sit still. You're just really jittery. Or you're easily bored. Those of you who have done Enneagram work, Enneagram sevens are often that. Tightening body is either that nauseous feeling in your gut or the clenching in your shoulders. I had a lady tell me, uh, she said, I can tell I'm anxious because my neck meat gets red. And then we watched her as her neck meat got red. And then we're all pausing because she used the word neck meat. We're like, you're describing yourself like a roast. <laughs> all right. So what do we have here? We've got spinning mind. Yeah. Tightening body starts in the right shoulder. Spinning mind, tightening body, shoulders and stomach. Good. All right. So let's just start with our spinning mind people. Chris or Mark, Kirk or Bill. Who would be willing to talk to us about what it's like in your spinning mind? I notice it the most waking up in the middle of the night. Good. So I, I, I will fall asleep out of exhaustion of, of everything and then wake up in the middle of the night and my head is going a thousand miles an hour. Like the idea of being able to like roll over and go back to sleep is not a possibility. And so I'll Good. sit there in bed for a couple hours until I can exhaust myself. Good. That's good. That's a great example, Bill. So what Bill's explaining there is the false belief. Remember how false belief generates anxiety? The false belief that I can worry my way to peace. What's typical for a spinning mind, I'm also a spinning mind, Bill, so I can relate to that, is we believe the lie that we can think harder to stop having to think at all. And so um, 
one of the things that Bill can do and fellow spinning mind people is they can try to locate the anxiety. Okay, where's it coming from? And then they can try to locate the belief. What do I believe that may not be true? And right at the end of our Zoom, I'll give us a couple of diffusion tools, but just a simple one, Bill, is love and laughter cast out anxiety. Love and laughter. Bill, I'll just ask a personal question. I'll take the risk. Are you married? Do you have a woman in your bed at night? I do. I know, it's a very personal question. I would not recommend groping your wife, <laughs> but um, one of the things I do is I put my hand on my wife's thigh just as a physical reminder that God is good to me because he gave me this amazing woman. Mm. And while I'm just that physical touch of love, and then I'm talking to God, thank you, Lord, for Lisa. Um, and that, that, you know, I'm not alone. Because one of the things chronic anxiety does is it convinces you that God's not with you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe another way to say it is you actually forget God's presence. Right. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find these hacks to remember God's with me, God's in this. And so what is it I'm anxious about? Well, whatever it is, God's already in it. Uh, maybe it's a meeting coming up. When I walk into that meeting, God's in that room. That's how I, that's how I worked as a chaplain. Mm -hmm. I would get anxious if maybe there were five deaths in a day and I'm just running out. It's 10 p.m. at night. I can't do it again. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I've forgotten that God's with me. But also when I walk into that room, it's not all on me. I'm entering the presence of God. Every time I get up to preach, Lord, as I walk out to that music stand, I'm walking into a place where God is sovereign and I can relax into the presence of God. So those are just a couple of a quick, quick tips there. But if you can learn to notice your body, it's a powerful tool. And what you're trying to do is lessen your tolerance. Most of us, anxiety puts us on a treadmill and then it just tells us to run faster and faster and faster and we're not going anywhere. And so if you can learn to notice when you're on a treadmill and simply get off that treadmill, it's really a powerful thing. One of the most powerful things that you can do with anxiety is learn to pause. Uh, and it takes a lot of discipline. So Jack, you said you're not sure. That's a perfectly reasonable answer. And it's not uncommon. A lot of people say, you know what? I actually am not sure when I'm anxious. Um, Jack, just I'm going to ask you again, a kind of a vulnerable question. Who in your life uh, loves you who maybe could help you with this? Do you have a wife or a child or grandkids or what's your yeah, situation? I, I do have a wife. She's, you know, 51 years with me. She hasn't left me yet. Okay, good. Uh, now, is your wife, are you guys still on, an, uh, on a death to us part or has she moved you to an annual renewal situation? Which one are you? <laughs> no, I, I would say on a scale of one to 10, uh, our relationship's probably a nine or a 10. Yeah, um, okay. I, I think in a way, Bill, I've probably experienced all of those things to some, some degree, but it might be a different situation each time that would cause a different response. You know what I mean? Um, uh, because I, I tend to be pretty calm and pretty much waiting for a situation to determine what my part will be in it. And so it's, I think, thoughtful on my part uh, going into, let's say, a tough board meeting or something like that. I already kind of know where I'm going and who I'm going to have to deal with. And I like what you said in the beginning, too. A calm person can quiet uh, an anxious person. And I've experienced that as well. Good. Yeah. So then whether it's, whether it's uh, you, Jack, or um, anyone else, if, if you're never sure, then in Jack's case, you just ask your wife a question. You say, how do you know I'm anxious before I know I'm anxious? That's good. Yeah. It's very simple. Um, I, I, I run a podcast and have guests on and we talk about anxiety and Scott McKnight, the theologian, yep. came on and um, I, I said, Scott, how do you know when you're anxious? And he said, oh, I don't get anxious. <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure what to do because everyone gets anxious. They just, but in his mind, he's like, well, I'm not really worried. I'm not afraid. So therefore I don't get anxious. And of course, as a podcast host, I don't, I'm not looking to trick my guests or, you know, I don't, I'm not there to expose anything. And I said, well, what is your wife? How does your wife answer that question? How would she say she knows you're anxious? Yeah. And he, he laughed and he says, oh, she would say that 
when I go to the man cave and read theology for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so anxiety is sophisticated. It's it's that's that's a way that would be a way of Scott getting smaller oh. when he's when he's anxious. Um, okay, so see, see, yeah. uh, and uh, you know I've talked about this with Leo Chappelle and the the phrase that i use is your doing shows your feeling or reveals your feeling yeah. reveals your thinking so yeah. is that you know the body keeps the score idea right you've probably done the you know trauma stuff um vendor right. book. but yeah your body what you're doing you're doing if you begin to become aware what am i doing that reveals your feeling you know the anxiety and then what's the thinking behind that is sort of that pathway yes uh, so yep that's exactly right is i had a question on this of just as you were talking about the some people get bigger some people get smaller that you know that there's sort of this and you talked about the enneagram of which um i'm very much um and you probably already know what number i am so um but of what you know, that there's a divine design. I mean, there's a, a way we show up sort of naturally of, of how our personality is. And, and that's, I mean, you know, part of that is embracing it, understanding it and utilizing it to be a blessing and to ourselves and to others. So there's not sort of this perfect way, right? Of that's not what you're trying to say of, of, um, you know, you talked about the goal is manage your reactivity from spilling into others, keeping from catching the reactivity coming at you from others. But yeah. part of that is, you know, in in our unique way, right, of how we're doing that. And each person, like you said, you've described part of your life and what triggers you and how you react. That's not going to change, you know, completely. You're not going to be another person, right? That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, everyone is wired differently, triggered by different things. There are 31 universal sources of anxiety, which is for another Zoom, but each of us have unique triggers. So like I'm a people pleaser and some of you aren't, and that doesn't make either of us better than the other. What you're trying to do is you're trying to learn how to relax into the awareness and presence of God mm. more often than you're doing now. That's the end goal. The end goal is always worship. Uh, and I, I do find it fascinating in Western Christianity, our ability to make anything into legalism, even spiritual disciplines. Chronic anxiety is generated when we are doing God's job for God and we're not being human sized. And that's kind of where we're headed as we get to the, the five core generators. And you said, but can you say that again to relax and what? Yeah, you're trying to relax into the presence of God. You're trying right. to. Okay. So, so that still means I work very hard. I, I do my best. I learn and grow. But I'm not crossing into the incessant need to always be blank. Usually you can tell your anxiety because it has an unrelenting expectation on your life. Hmm. You must always know the answer. You must have every sermon be the best. It, it's these hard edge expectations that make us anxious. Yeah. All right, let me kind of take us to the next level. So these are the five broad sources of human chronic anxiety. And I have three of these five. Most of us do not have all five. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is try to help you see where you are on the big five. So those of you who are control freaks, um, I, I was in um, Chicago uh, doing a keynote. And, um, I, you know, it's like people fly into Chicago and they want deep dish pizza. And they say to the Chicago, and, okay, I want to, go to, want to go to Gino's East. But the local says, no, no, you want to go to Lou Malnetti's because the locals are control freak and they are trying to control your best experience, whether you think it's the best or not. Uh, so some of you, when you're not able to control the situation, you get really anxious. Some of you are perfectionists. You can always tell a perfectionist because they can't take a compliment and maybe they don't correct you out loud, but they do in their heart. 
Jesus says the same thing, by the way. You can always tell a perfectionist because they've never once looked at their work and said that was well done. They're always dangling the carrot out of reach, the incessant desire for something to be perfect. Uh, and then we get to the bottom three, which is mine, having the answer that I've shared enough about that. If I'm in a room, someone asks a question, I believe I must know. Being there for people, that's me too. If somebody somewhere is hurting, I get this incessant desire to start randomly baking lasagna. I just have to do deliver a lasagna. Like if you're anxious, I must rush in and help. And then people's approval, that's me as well. So I'll... Um, stick these uh, in the chat and let's see if you can just tell us, okay, which of these five is you? Uh, and it might be all of them. It might be one or two, but here they are. And if you already see them, uh, let's see how this type it out here. I'll go. Um... Of the ones that uh, that you've just cited, I guess having the answer is probably the one that comes to be first. I, I look back and uh, I've been a pastor since the you know, about 40 years. And the first 10 years or so, I dealt a whole lot more with this than I have since then because I went through a, a crisis that lasted a solid year. And I came out the other side learning a whole lot about grace and uh, learning about grace. I, as we're talking, the thing I keep coming back to is, look, I'm a mess. They're messes. We're all messes. It's okay. Jesus is grace for us all. And that, that attitude has uh, greatly helped me in, uh, in dealing with all kinds of ministry uh, uh, crises. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's not uncommon, Glenn, that as you get older, you do outgrow some of the bigger grips of anxiety for sure. Mm. And then we're seeing people here in the chat. So for somebody who hasn't shared out loud yet, um, and you've put something in the chat, go ahead and unmute and just tell us a bit, give us a bit more context about your answer. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and join this, but I got to tell you, I'm a chaplain too, so I could, uh, I could wait a while too. Um, I say, given the, given the circumstances, I could be all five of them. Um, with, with my background, um, you know, you, I spent 25 years practicing law so you have to be in control in the courtroom. Yeah. You have to be a perfectionist. You have to have all of the answers. Um, as a deputy district attorney, you had to be there for people. Uh, and so, and of course, what greater approval is there than a verdict in your favor? So, um, so yeah, I would say, I would say that, um, and I, and I certainly, the funny thing is, is for 25 years, I lived with a lot of anxiety. When I, when I gave in to the Lord's calling and went to, um, went to seminary and as a pastor, I know that I'm doing what the Lord's calling me to do. And I have nowhere near the anxiety yeah. that I did as a lawyer. Good. Yeah. Uh, I love that you're sharing that because Mark, there's some professions that require chronic anxiety for them to thrive. I can't speak to the legal profession, but I did some work for a political operative. Yeah. And she was 24 seven on call with the Senator in DC and she's yeah. like, what am I going to do? And I said, oh, quit, just quit. Well, then he'll get someone else, she said. And I'm like, that's, that's right. <laughs> that's, 
you need you need out of that system you cannot become unless but what's, but what's really weird is how addicted you get to that level of adrenaline too right that's right yeah and you get financially rewarded there's all kinds of idolatry underneath right um, inhuman behavior so let's just go back to the big five and uh let me just ask you a sunday school question as you look at these five traits who do you happen to know who's always in control is the only being in the universe who's perfect yeah knows everything it's my Christ. Lord and Savior Jesus, right. and He's the one that I. He's the one that now I can go to. You know, right. I I didn't. You know, in a courtroom, a judge, <laughs> a judge thinks that they're all of that, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, my neighbor's a judge. We have a lot of fun together. Um, yeah. So. So the idea here is that in Genesis 3, the very first temptation that the tempter gave to Adam and Eve is you can be like God. That was the offer. Right. And the theology of chronic anxiety is that anytime we cross over into God's job, it generates in us chronic anxiety. So anytime we try to do it perfectly instead of well enough, anytime we must control it instead of simply giving order to something. Uh, the very the very knowledge of good and evil is having the answer. Any time that we believe that if somebody's hurting, we must be there for them. That's what's known in the industry as a messiah complex. So you can see that chronic anxiety is generated when we cross over from being human sized into trying to be like God. And so this is just a very simple like anxiety volcano. You know, in the Bible, when the Bible talks about self righteousness. It's not saying that I think I'm better than you. That's how our culture defines self-righteousness. In the Bible, self-righteousness is anything I depend on when I'm not depending on Christ for my righteousness or my shalom, my well-being. And so what's built on that is what we want, which is the big five. And then what we'll get to now is my chronic anxiety, which is my beliefs. When I don't get them, I then get reactive and out the volcano comes anger, silence, criticism, and, and so on. So this is why I really believe that the gospel truly is the number one antidote to chronic anxiety. So this one I'm going to go quickly on because I know we're a little short on time, but this is some homework for you. And I'll just say it's quite difficult to do this. Um, but what you're trying to figure out is what do I think I need in any given moment that I don't actually need? And this is homework. Maybe you guys can discuss it on your own. You're trying to get from the big five down to your core beliefs that are false. So if I'm a people pleaser and I'm a, always wanting to be there for others, want to always know the answer, then my homework is, well, as it relates to my preaching then, what's a belief about my preaching that's making me anxious? And one of my beliefs is, I believe every sermon I ever preach must be the best sermon you've ever heard. And so when that doesn't happen, I get filled with chronic anxiety. I want to resign or I feel all this pressure or I want to hide after a service if it wasn't this magnificent message or something. So see how you go from the big five down to your core beliefs. Now, this is the area, the reason it's homework is we all have between a dozen and 50 false beliefs that we depend on when we're not depending on Jesus. I don't say that to guilt us or shame us. I know some Christian authors, they, they like to say, you should try harder. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm just saying that um, if I want a deeper encounter with Christ, I have to let Christ rummage deeper into my Romans 12 thinking patterns. Yeah. And you can look at the way you parent your children through this question. Um, how much money do you have to have in the bank account for you to rest in Christ? Like, the implication of this question filters into every aspect of your life. So at our church, we do this over a 12 month journey rather than a 90 minute zoom. We really go deep. I'll show you the online version of that for those of you who want to dive in. But what you then do is having named your belief statement. We're now into all this homework. You actually write down 
what do you do when you don't get it? So when I preach and I don't think it went well, it doesn't matter how it actually went, but when I don't think it went well, what do I do next? Well, what I typically do is I either want to hide backstage rather than be with people. And then I have to get my wife to tell me it was amazing. <laughs> That's what happens next. And then, okay, so I've written that down. What do I do next? What do I do next? And then in the afternoon, I usually go into some form of, I wish I could resign and sell vintage Ferraris. Or if it went really well, it's worse. If I walk off that stage and say, you know what, that was a great sermon. It's worse because then on Monday, I'm like, well, how am I going to top that? It's now you can hear there's no gospel in any of this. It's all performance anxiety. It's this is what chronic anxiety does is it puts me in a false reality. God's nowhere to be found. And it's me, 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 me. It's very ego driven. So what do I do next? Okay, well, what about the impact? Well, this is a terrible way to live. I, there's no shalom in my life. Jesus says his yoke is easy. I'm like, no, it's not Jesus. It's a hard yoke. What a, I go into self-pity. What a hard life I have as a pastor. No one, I'm like Elijah in the Old Testament. No one understands how hard it is to be me. What about the impact on others? Well, one of the things I do next is I need my wife to lie to me and tell me it was a good sermon. So when I go home, what I expect out of Lisa is that she's in lingerie and she's saying, Steve, that sermon was so magnificent. We must consummate the sermon. Like that's the only appropriate response is to consummate. Like we ought to celebrate that sermon. And I'd be like, yeah, that's right. Now that never happens because she's managing her own pressures at church and she's got to line out the door. People want to talk to her. But because she won't pat me on the head, I then start to wonder about our relationship. It's crazy what chronic anxiety does. So this is homework as well, this page. So good. And then what you have to do, and this is homework as well, is you have, once you've done, okay, your, your big five, then your core belief, and then the impact, that was the last page, was the impact. Then these are the three steps to actually experience Romans 12 transformation. You have to externalize. That's what the Bible calls confession. The problem with most people is they keep their anxiety in their head and they never name it. But Kurt Thompson reminds us that we name things to tame things. And I don't believe biblical confession is just for sin. Or maybe a better way to say it is that I believe sin is a very broad category of any time you're missing the mark with God. Mm. And so if, if you take some of the moral implication out of sin and just say, am I, am I in God's shalom? No, well, then I'm in sin. Um, then confession becomes a key way. And so you have to name it to somebody. Then you need help. If, if assumptions got you into your anxiety, then it's also assumptions keeping you stuck in your anxiety. And so I had all these assumptions about my preaching. We were a small struggling church plant. I believe that if I didn't preach the best every week, our church was going to close. We wouldn't grow all these assumptions going into interchange and out of change. And then you have to bravely practice the opposite of your belief. So if you're a control freak, you have to sign up in the toddler room in your church. <laughs> Toddlers are a great gift to control freaks. Perfectionists, you build a bookcase that wobbles and then show it to someone and brag about it. Make sure it's three to five degrees off true. Make sure there's a drip in the varnish and then show it. Uh, one of the things I've done, I've worked with some communications staff on church. I say, you have to put three grammatical errors in your email this week. It just drives, no, I couldn't do that. They're crazy. Uh, and so what I did in 2012 is once I'd figured out this preaching idol I had, is I got up in front of my church and I preached a really boring, incoherent sermon. But I didn't tell them that's what I was doing. The stories made no sense. The points went nowhere. <laughs> I got up and preached a terrible sermon on purpose. And then the next day, the crazy thing, like the sun came up the next day, that was surprising. And then the next week people came back. And what's interesting about this is I'm still passionate about preaching. Well, I put a lot of time into my sermons, but I'm no longer in the tyrannous grip of perfect sermons, the unrealized ideal. You know, Dallas Willard, right? 
He's the one that teaches us to do, be faithful and trust God with the outcomes. That's a very relaxed way to live. And so a simple prayer I pray is Jesus died so I don't have to blank anymore. Jesus died so I don't have to preach gold standard sermons anymore. Jesus died to free me from needing Lisa's approval on every sermon anymore. But also, Jesus died so when I'm in an elders meeting and they ask me a question I don't know, I can say I don't know. He's freed me from having to have the answer. So this is just a very simple prayer I pray when I notice my anxiety. Because what's going on is we expect more from ourselves than God does. It's like we're walking on a tight rope of eggshells and we, we feel like we're just about to fall at any moment. But really what God expects is human-sized followers. That's all God, all God has ever needed is human-sized followers partnering with a supernatural God to change the world. But subtly over time, because we're all legalists, we suddenly take God's job and put it on our shoulders. And we were never designed to be God. We were always designed to follow God. And that's a different thing. We were designed to worship God. And rather than try, our job is to die. I believe the number one reason that Christians in America are not growing in Christ is because they're trying rather than dying. This is my next book. I believe if we die more and try less, we are further transformed. Because in the New Testament, Paul lays out for us the clear division of labor. Die to self, and then Jesus transforms us into his image. It's God's work to transform us. But how many of us take the fruit of the Spirit, and we work on our patience, and we work on our self-control? That's the fruit of the human. If you want to actually be a more patient person, rather than like driving in the slow lane and those kinds of tricks, just figure out what false belief is making me irritable and die to that. And now having died in Christ, I am now resurrected into a, into a new life. So we've got just about 10 minutes left. Let me just pause. We've got a, one more tool, kind of a diffusion tool. But let me just see, because obviously we've traveled quite a distance just now. And let me see where you're at or Doug, if there's a direction you want to take us. And then I'll show us one more tool and that will probably wrap up our time. Steve, this has been enormously helpful. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I do have kind of a context I'd like you to address. Um, and it's, it's pretty broad, <laughs> but maybe you could have some help here. So all of the people on the call here work with groups in one way or another. And um, when that group gathers, typically there's going to be someone who's going through an anxious situation in their own church. They're going to be bringing that into the group. Um, you know, how is it that you identify it? What would you try to do to diffuse it, you know, to speak to it? How, how do you work with that, you know, given the kinds of uh, seven to eight pastors in a room sharing their situation, going from there? They may not think they're anxious, but they are. Um, Mark, was it you that said you're a chaplain? Yeah. Mark, have you, have you done the tool called the verbatim? I'm sorry, the tool called? It's called a verbatim. It's a tool that's often used in chaplaincy where you have to write an essay on a, on a chaplain encounter. Have you ever done one of those? I have not. Okay. I don't, I I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a hospital chaplain. I am a law enforcement and, yeah. and disaster chaplain. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the, the challenge we have here, Doug, is, is this kind of work is, is deep and slow. And so a 90 minute like this is kind of a peek into a way of being. Um, but the general, like in, in a short way, the general rule of anxiety is simply talking about it makes you less anxious. So I would encourage your coaches just to invite people to do what I've modeled for you guys. Have the coach name, like what Dave did for us, name your anxiety and invite your pastors to name what makes them anxious. And that'll just naming it will make them less anxious. And then a verbatim, I wrote about it in MLA. So there's a whole chapter on how to do a verbatim. Right. That would be something you could try. And you could say, hey, if you had an encounter, why don't you just type it up for us? Um, and we're going to like try to help you with it. 
because typing it up, what you're trying to do with your anxiety is you're trying to get from under it to on top of it. So just typing it up makes you on top of it because you're thinking about it. And then presenting it to your group makes you on top of it. So that's a tool as well. Um, and then I'll show you if you guys want to uh, do a paid resource, a lot of people, um, they've signed up for Capable Life, which is my one year program. I'll put, a, I'll put it in the chat for you. And I'll just take three or four minutes to show you what it is because it's, it's very affordable. I, I really don't do infomercials. So I'm mindful of not taking much time, but it's simply an online portal with 10 minute videos and self-assessments that you and your pastors can go through together and then you can use this curriculum. So you don't have to be the anxiety expert. You just have to watch a video with your pastor, with whoever you're coaching and do self-assessments together. And it guides you on how to coach people through it. We have about 550 people from 16 countries on this. Uh, we have entire church staffs that sign up together for this. And so what it is, is it's a video library, it's confidential discussion, deep dive masterclasses and Zoom meetings. And what happens is most people, they just use the video library. So what I've done with you today is about 5%, maybe 3% of all the resources on the site. And I, we did this one, Intro to Anxiety and You. And we just moved really quickly. But if you were to sign up, Intro to Anxiety and You is actually uh, a number of 10 minute videos and two self-assessments. So you can see it's nine things where you do a pre-assessment, then you watch these 10 minute videos, and then you do a post-assessment. Once you do the assessment, it emails itself to you. So you could assign this as coaches uh, to your people, and then you could say, all right, we're watching three videos this month and bring your self-assessment to our next meeting. But the other beauty of this is there's so many topics. So like one of the things we do People are bringing a case and we put it through the universal sources of anxiety. I was just teasing a moment ago and said there's 31 universal sources. As a coach, you can help diagnose what's going on. You could watch those videos. How does anxiety work in groups? What's it like? How do you figure out a usual suspect critic? How do you dissolve resistance when you're trying to bring change? You can see all of these different modules. How do your family of origin dynamics affect you and the people you lead? So we've got scads of material. Then we have these different Zoom meetings and these are all optional. I am on the Zooms as well, so you can connect with me. We have these discussion forums where you can post a case and get help. So that's that would be what I recommend. It's, it's 28 a month uh, or it's 280 a year. We're putting prices up in September, so there's no rush. Prices will go up in September, but... Um, that would be, that's the best resource I offer. And it's also my most affordable way to use me. Usually my Zooms and me in person gets pretty expensive. But if, if you just want your teams to sign up, all you have to do is assign a module, you watch it together, and then you talk about it together. That's going to get you a long, long way. And as you go through the modules, you'll learn how to present cases and how to help them with their cases. And everything in the book and a whole bunch more is in there. So that would be my my kind of sales pitch answer, I guess. So I wanted to go back to where you preached a bad sermon on purpose. Did you ever think of just standing up and telling everybody, I really feel this pressure to preach a perfect sermon and it doesn't, it doesn't work if you let everyone in on it. It, it, it kind of, you have to just live with the fact that after the bad sermon, people came up and said, thank you so much, Steve. God really spoke today. <laughs> so it, it doesn't work if everyone's in on it. You, it, has to be, it has to be just something you do. Because what you're doing is you're, you're, it's a way you test your assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I'm looking at the clock. Um, I said three o'clock. I want to hold to that for everybody who has been involved in this. Um, Steve's book, in case you haven't picked it up, is Managing Leadership Anxiety. Uh, and so, you know, it goes more deeply into some of the concepts that he's presented here. But also, um, thanks for the, the brief intro to, to Capable Life, too. So it was really helpful. Sure. Um, Steve, yeah. so, so really appreciate um, just the, the topic and the gospel centeredness of all of it. 
and uh, pray for God's blessing on you and the work that you're doing. And um, thank you all of you for being a part of this. Uh, we have our next one next week with Gary Mays. The topic is spiritual authority. And we'll be talking about that same time, 1.30 uh, for about an hour and a half. So that's all for today. Uh, thanks so, so much. Uh, God bless each of you in what you're doing. Thanks again, Steve. So Great. where will we be able to find this? Is this was all being recorded? Where do we find it? Uh, you know, it's going to be on the TM website. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. And, and, and we'll, get this, we'll get this available. I'll, I'll show you how to, I'll send Steve's uh, stuff to you and also the link that you can use if you want to watch it some more or share it with someone. Good. This is so, helpful. Thank you. Good. Yep. Very good. Perfect. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. Yep. Bye-bye. I know.